Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War Two TV. So this is the first of a series of myth busting shows that are coming your way next week. And the reason I'm doing this one, it's very simple. I was trying to work out how to explain to the other guests that all lined up to appear how I wanted it to kind of go. So I thought, well, why don't you just do one yourself, Woody, and put it out there? Then we can use that as the model to to work on. So that's what we're going to do. So the claim in this show is about Normandy in 1944. As you know, or you may not know, I live in Normandy. I've been living here for 20 years. I've been a battlefield guide for most of that time. Now I mostly do this channel. And there's an idea that the Normandy campaign is all about the bocage, or the French word meaning the hedgerows. You've all seen the photos, and I'll be bringing up some photos in a minute. And that is at the root of all the problems in the Normandy campaign. Everywhere in Normandy was full of uh, bocage, and that's the whole, that's the story. It's like North Africa, desert, Burma, jungle, Germany, urban warfare. Um, that's the kind of the ideas we've got. And But of course, the minute we examine any of those notions, they kind of fall apart. Yes, there's lots of jungle in Burma. There's also lots of hills where there isn't jungle. Um, the desert, north at Tunisia. Yes, there's lots of uh, sand and, and rock there, but there's also uh, temperate climate. There's also other aspects as well. So Normandy isn't all bocard. That's the claim. And I'm going to look at it and kind of debunk it with you now. So I'll bring up my slides. So my first point, because I'm going to ask each of my guests to make a kind of few points to, to back their claims. So the thing is, first, my first point is Normandy is made up of a variety of terrain types. Normandy is about 4,000 square miles. Um, this is what we think of in terms of Bocage. This I use this same image as the graphic for the show there. It's the Americans there in the sunken lanes, the, the jeeps going up and down the mud there, the big earth banks, the dense vegetation. This is meant to be just near Saint-Lô in 1944 in July. There's an aerial photo showing that patchwork quilt effect of, of small fields. And if you want to know more about how hedgerows work and where they come from and how many there are these days, I've put the link in the description below to the hedgerows video I made uh, four years ago on World War II TV, which you can go into more detail about where they are, where, where they're, what types there are and how much exists today. But that's what we think of. That's what we think of when we think of Normandy hedgerows. Uh, and there's another photo there. You know, the sunken lanes, the, 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 the foliage that kind of engulfs you from both sides that's our image and a lot of people think that's the entire Normandy campaign that's what it is if you're a British soldier a Canadian soldier American soldier that's what you're facing for 76 days uh bocards like that so here's a map of Normandy and I've added some rather basic green ovals or shapes there those are the areas I would say are the the ones where we really see lots and lots of bocage. That doesn't mean there isn't some bocage and hedgerows outside of those areas. So towards the lower middle part, when you get towards Via, towards Fleur, there is certainly some bocage over there. There's a little bit up uh, just south of Cherbourg that I haven't included in the oval there. But I would say that those are the areas where the, you really see that patchwork quilt effect of hedgerows. Notice the gap, by the way, between the two top green uh, shapes there. That's the area kind of inland from Isigny sur Mer, uh, where in fact it was an area of, of floods on D Day. We've talked about that on World War II TV before, just like the floods behind Utah Beach, just like the floods up where the Sixth Airborne were near the Dive River. That was an area there, kind of the Ur River and in towards San Lo from kind of the the, the north uh, uh, west of San Lo and the area kind of south of Carenton. Yes, there's some bocage in that, but it's also typified by lots of marais, which is the French word for marsh, so flat areas there, bridges become important. So I haven't included or extended the green ovals into those uh, areas. So Ian is already asking. We're not probably going to have time for questions during many of the myth-busting shows, but because I'm in a good mood today, we'll address this one. Uh, grass is basically in the bocage, it's primarily grass. It's dairy country, it's cattle, it's beef cattle, it's mostly grass. There's, you, basically, the west of that map, as you look at it there, is um, uh, cattle and animal farming. The eastern map is arable. I mean, it doesn't quite divide that neatly. That's basically what we're talking about. So when we look at that map there, when we think of the Normandy campaign extending as it did into September, the fighting up towards La Havre, there's no hedgerows up near La Havre. The areas up towards Rouen from uh, east of Caen, there's no hedgerows over there. There's very few hedgerows in the area around Caen, north of Caen, south of Caen. Uh, the western coast over there coming down towards uh, Coutances coming down there. Not many hedgerows around there. So already we can see, just looking at that map, that the Bocage doesn't cover the whole of Normandy anyway. I would say 
back at the time in 1944, maybe 40% of the battlefield was hedgerows. Let's say some of that. You could argue it was a bit more. You could always argue a bit less. But that's my first point is Normandy wasn't all hedgerows anyway, okay? Um, my second point, the hedgerows has become a kind of a catch-all term and not always used accurately. So I found in my experience here and other people who, you know, Colin lives here, is you speak even to British veterans or Canadian veterans, perhaps 10 years ago, they would talk about fighting in the bocage because it's become that term. I said a minute ago, we think of, you know, oh, I fought in the desert, North Africa. I fought in Normandy. They associate the word bocage with it. Now, sometimes what the British are actually fighting in Normandy, and I'll show you a map later, is they're fighting in the valleys near the Odon or the Orne River, where it is um, a, a battlefield where you have rivers and streams there, but it isn't necessarily bocage in how we understand the word to really mean its use. And in between those areas of the, around the valleys, you have the big open, sweeping, uh, rolling kind of flat hill or hills with the with the wheat fields, the corn fields, that type of thing. Okay, so. We we like we use the word we we don't I don't because I'm I'm better than that but we use the words like tigers to refer to every German tank uh, sniper meaning every single uh, single rifleman uh, uh, Panzer meaning every time you know th those every gun being an 88 these are terms that we've come to kind of use that we now realize it's a catch-all term so hedgerows has come to mean kind of a hedgerows. Uh, 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 hedgerows has come to mean a definition of the entire battlefield when it is only really talking about specific areas. So that's the first, the, the second point there. It's just become a catch-all term. And when you examine it, 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 it can kind of fall away uh, quite quickly. Um, and in fact, my argument is, my, my, ca my counter myth is that it was often the ridges, the hills, and the rivers, and indeed those pesky Germans that caused the delays. Yes, while the troops were fighting towards the hills, towards the German defended positions, they were fighting through Bocage sometimes. But my argument is it wasn't necessarily the Bocage that was causing the problems. It was the high ground ahead of them, or it was the Germans ahead of them that was actually causing for the problems, um, if, if you follow my drift there. So to illustrate that, Another hastily put together woody diagram there. That's the battle towards Cherbourg. Okay, so my red ovals there. So the one, the lower one to the right, that's the Kinneville Ridge. So when the fourth division pushed up from Utah Beach, so Utah Beach is off the bottom right of that in the you know right hand corner. The fourth infantry division pushed up the coast there, essentially heading towards Cherbourg. And you've got the 79th division uh, over to the left. You've got other divisions coming in. American Ninth Division come in later on. The Kinneville Ridge there is where the Germans had a lot of um, uh, artillery and units, and it was the high ground that was causing the delay up the coast there, and also the floods, and the German Wiedersdorn's nest along the coast. Now, if you were to ask a GI who fought in that area there to describe the terrain around it, or to describe the difficulties, he might have said, well, it was the Bocage, but my argument would be it wasn't so much the Bocage as the high ground. And the same point about the, the smiley-shaped red oval at the top there. That's the line of German defences around the, the, the city of Cherbourg. Now, some of those defences would include areas that you would describe as bocage and hedgerows. But again, my point is, was it the actual hedgerows causing the problem, or was it a well-organised German defence who've had time over the previous two weeks to get them themselves together in the right place? Cherbourg tended to a to attract the kind of the better, better motivated Germans, Germans who were commanding units in other areas who were, were seen to be quite good, were pushed up the Cherbourg area in the in the weeks and months before D-Day to, to, to command some of the artillery uh, positions on the coast there. And there's lots of German bunkers up there. So, so yes, as you're pushing up towards Cherbourg, you are encountering Germans who are holding very uh, notable features, including high ground and hills. And some of that fighting is in the Bocage, but I would make the point that it isn't necessarily the Bocage that's causing the problems. It's just that the Bocage is in between you as the attacking soldier and the objective you're trying to get to. And I would increase uh, the second uh, slide to support that argument here. It's not as good a map, that one. That's now later on. The Allies have pushed up the Cherbourg. They liberate Cherbourg. Now they're coming down again towards more towards the western coast. And the five red circles there 
And Ian Carr, who's watching, has done this with me because he was on my uh, one of my tours this year. And we took him to the Lahey de Puy area and we showed that area there. So those are the five hills. That are I'm not going to go into the massive details about the Hay de Puy battle there, but they have artillery observers across those hills. There's flooded areas sometimes between those areas. And within that are hedgerows. But it's the hills that are the main problem there, not the hedgerows. So the GIs who fought through there, the 79th Division, the 90th Division, at Moncastra. Moncastra is the bottom right of those ovals there, Hill 122, over to the left, Hill 84, bloody Hill 84, where there's the 79th fort. Bangs in the middle there is Hill 95, the last battle of the 82nd Airborne in Normandy, and the top two are the other two hills coming in there. The French call them the Five Mountains. They're not quite mountains, they're hills. So the point I'm making is, is it's those hills, it's those features that are causing the problems. And of course, flooded areas beyond and uh, the pesky Germans again, and some of the Germans at the bottom of that map coming in later on the Das Reich division. It's though it's the Germans that are causing the problems, not the hedgerows per se. So um, my next point, because the whole point of these myth shows is they're they're nice and they're nice and breezy. We 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 smash through them very quickly to bring new people to the channel to watch these shorter format shows. So sometimes units stuck in the bocage weren't actually stuck in the bocage. They were not advancing because that was part of the overall Allied plan. Right. What do I mean by that? Let's look at a, plan, a map of Normandy in early July. So I just talked about the fighting up for the Cherbourg Peninsula there. So immediately after D-Day, troops from Utah Beach push up towards Cherbourg. They get to Cherbourg. The harbour ended up not being quite as um, uh, usable as they were hoping. And then they have to fight their way down again. So the Germans put a defensive line in as the Allies attack from south to north. And then once the Allies have taken Cherbourg and come back down again, the Germans put another line in, or kind of the same one moved down a bit. The Malman line have to fight through that line again to then to get to the area down. If you see the bottom of the, the map there, or the bottom left, you can see Coutances, and then there's that where the, uh, the two numbers are on that map. That's the Lesay saint lo Highway, which is where eventually the Operation Cobra breakout started so what i'm saying is is that if you look in the middle of a the map there you see san lo uh, towards the middle there and there's the bulge in there from from bay uh that's where the american uh first army is uh initially it was fifth corps there so they are advancing towards san lo but they can't they're not able to put commit fully to taking san lo until seventh corps and the army over to the left has pushed up towards Cherbourg and taken that so what I'm, saying, what I'm saying is, if you're a, a soldier in the 29th Division, the 2nd Division, the 1st Division, the 30th Division, the 35th Division, who are in the area inland of what we would call the Omaha Beachhead in late June and even into early July, you don't feel that you're moving very fast because you're not. The 29th Division are fighting for weeks for the areas around Hill 192, uh, um, which is just um, uh, northeast of San Lo. Uh, they're 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 stubbornly held back there but are they stubbornly held back there or is uh the front not meant to be moving too fast in that point because they've got to get the bit over to the west cleared first once they've got the bit to the west cleared and then the, the army from over there can move down that the you know the the the, the dog's head shape of the coten tan peninsula then a few days after this map would be they're in the area down uh, more in line with the, uh, the first army over to the middle there, and then the whole whole American front can push off south and then do the breakout. Okay, so that's my point is that sometimes when you're stuck by the hedgerows, you're not actually being restricted by the hedgerows. It's that the unit you're part of is not really meant to be advancing fully at that point. It's kind of you're in a kind of a holding role, which brings us to my final point point. What about the Duke forces over in the East? So if you don't know the term Duke, Duke uh, Dominion, United Kingdom and Empire. So that would count any uh, of the uh, the troops that are kind of fighting over for the for the for the British and Canadians ostensibly. But we have the Poles invo involved in there as well. The you know, we said the Canadians. So if you look over to the East, there's the same map I used earlier. So um, the British and, and Canadians and the Duke forces are, are, are battling for Caen. Now. As I said earlier, there's almost no hedgerows or bocage anywhere near Caen. What is it like near Caen? It's like that near Caen. Big, 
open swathes of of crops arable crops so not not like over in the west where the hedgerows are where it's grass for cattle crops big open sweeping areas um and and there's another photo there from the british sector there just uh, i add neil's is commenting there because neil's is great lack of movement on the san low front seems to actually have taken attention away from the american forces actually advancing so exactly by not moving too much towards san lo the germans are kind of you know, deceived into maybe moving their force into the wrong places. And it's, you can't move all your pieces forward on the chess point, chess board at the same time. Um, and so the British and Duke forces over these, to some extent, are holding around core so the German army smashes itself to pieces against it. The sweeping uh, push up towards Cherbourg is over to the west, to the left, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that's what the countryside is like around Caen, not hedgerows, open fields. And so my last point, which is basically just reiterating what I've already said, was it actually the Bocage or was it a stubborn German defense that caused any perceived delays in the Allied uh, campaign in Normandy? I would say it's not really the Bocage that causes the problems. I think it's it's a generally a quite well-organized German defense in places. Panzerlehr Division do quite well there. Some of the Falschermeg units do particularly well holding some of their bits of high ground. The Germans knew that the Allies would have to push for these bridges. There's the flooded areas that caused the Germans to to to, to know where it gave the, the Germans the ability to know where the Allies are pushing because the Americans and, and uh, were, were canalized up these roads through the floods when they're coming down towards La Haye de Puy, they have to go past these hills. The Germans know they have to go past these hills. Their artillery can, can hit them on the way in. They, the Americans have to clear their way through these hills there. So I think what's happened over the last 80 years is that um, the, 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 the hedgerows, the bocage, has been a convenient kind of coat hook to pin any perceived problems. They're like, oh, well, it was all the hedgerows, as if, as if that's the thing that caused all the problems here, because it's not a person, it's not tactics. If you blame the hedgerows, it's like it's not your fault. Now, in some cases, in the Allied in the in the Battle of Normandy, we can look at Allied command decisions and say, you know what, they weren't very good there. You know what, their tank uh, infantry cooperation wasn't working very well. You know what, they hadn't quite got their air ground uh, units working. Uh, neatly in conjunction with each other but blaming the hedgerows is like a it's a neutral thing you're blaming it's rather than rather than identifying you, you sometimes the, the own allied um errors oh well it's the hedgerows that's that's what it all, all was and the other thing is and i've talked about this before the germans hated the hedgerows too um the germans didn't that they found them difficult to maneuver in um but that's only in the areas where the hedgerows were does that make sense right so I don't think it really was the Bocars, the hedgerows that caused the problems. It was, it was, you know, bridges, uh, flooding, and and as importantly, the Germans being quite good at what they were doing um, in terms of how to defend, how to fall back. Look at what they were doing in the Eastern Front. You know, after Barbarossa goes tits up for the Germans, they are able to kind of fight and fall back pr pretty in an organized way. Okay, Stalingrad is against the run of the, the run of play there but the germans are very very good at falling back so kind of you are retreating but you're falling back and you're making the enemy uh lose casualties to push you out and, and the germans are good at that so there we are um the format question just because we will just talk about the myth show it basically will be the guest will come on make their three or four points like i have done today and i will just jump in with some odd comments i don't think we'll have time for questions from the viewers because the whole point is to get these shows out snappy snappy might have a time for a couple of them at the end we'll see how it goes um and as neil said their germans taking advantage of all the terrains and their different features was the real problem and to kind of summarize everything and kind of end it up i don't think the allies were slow in normandy anyway i think when you look at the original projections you know montgomery and okay, some of the people watching it will hate montgomery some people will like montgomery but not his original sort of estimations when he was talking to the allied allied uh, commanders in the spring of 44 was you know we'll get out of normandy within 90 days they were out of Normandy within 77 days. 
uh, fewer casualties than they had perhaps predicted at the worst in the worst projections. Yes, there was lots of loss of life. Um, and, and yes, some of the units struggle at times to adapt to the, the type of fighting that normally would require. You know, for example, the British 7th Armour Division didn't didn't get off to a fantastic start. Neither did the British 51st Division. Some of the American units that fought elsewhere struggled to adapt to the, to the change of terrain and the change of, of, of dynamics of Normandy compared to perhaps Italy or, or North Africa. So there we are. Um, it's um, it's fun debunking these myths. And that's the whole point of that show. These shows is to kind of look at some of these established ideas and 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 analyze them. Maybe not completely debunk them because you know, there's a, where there's smoke, there's fire type thing. Is that I think sometimes there is stereotypes exist because there's some truth to them. So sometimes the myths are not they're not completely wrong. It's just that, that we've we've labeled ladled too much onto them. We've kind of put too much emphasis on them, and that's the whole point, really. So my argument has been that um, Normandy isn't all hedgerows. Uh, Normandy wasn't all hedgerows then. It isn't all hedgerows now. A lot of people who fought in a Normandy campaign barely saw any hedgerows. If you were in the Canadian 2nd Division, you barely saw any hedgerows. If you were in the Polish Armour Division, you barely saw any hedgerows. Some of the American units, you barely saw hedgerows. It depends where you were. It depends what you're fighting. Um, the the idea is is to just consider the fact how we use that word. Why are we saying normally is hedgerows? We're saying it because it's convenient. As I said earlier, North Africa, desert, Burma, jungle, Normandy, hedgerows. It kind of makes it easy to understand. Anybody who's been to Normandy, and there's lots of you watching there, you will realize it changes, you know, in a blink of an eye as you drive around Normandy. You go from flat bits to hilly bits to, to, to open fields to, to the hedgerows that we were talking about. And uh, everybody's experience in the Battle of Normandy was different. So there we are. That's basically what the format of this is going to be. To can prepare you for this, these shows will be coming your way starting on Monday. So if you're in the, U in the UK, there will be three shows per evening. Uh, for example, the 14th is an East to the Front themed uh, evening. So we've got Waitman Bjorn coming on, uh, Prit Buttar coming on, and Grant Hayward uh, coming on to talk about various aspects of the Eastern Front. Some some evenings haven't really got a theme. There will be two or three shows in the morning UK time or evening Australia, New Zealand time, depending on where you are, uh, because I've got some guests from Australia coming on. So Peter Williams is coming on to do some bus myth busting about Kokoda. Um, Robin Pryor going to be doing some myth busting about the perception of the German soldier being the best soldier of World War II. That's the whole point of these shows. Come on, examine one of these claims and and, and, and hopefully debunk it. So that's the format. Uh, I've been 22 minutes, but that is because I've been explaining a little bit about how the format works. So um, there we are. I will leave things there. Just to remind you, we've got another show coming your way tomorrow. I'm so looking forward to tonight's show. Um, Dilip Amin is coming on to talk about Britain's and the world's first integrated air defense system, which includes the Battle of Brint Brit Britain bunker in Uxbridge, but also includes the communications. He's got some amazing analogies of how to describe all this, uh, spiders, webs, and things like that. His graphics are fantastic. We've had two or three chats already setting up the show. I can't wait for that one. That's 7 p.m. GMT or 2 p.m. E uh, ST. And then lots of myth busting coming your way next week. So hopefully this has given you something to think about and uh, and your perception of normally maybe have altered a little bit by this. As I again remind you, there's a link below to my full video about what hedros are and where you can find them and what exists today. That's in the description below. But right now, I'll say thank you very much for joining us. This is Paul Woodard for World War II TV showing, uh, saying have a, have a good afternoon. I will see you later. Cheers. Thanks for watching. Bye.